How's it going everyone? My name is Justin and today I bring you what I feel might be a huge game changer for the Assassin's Creed franchise. Before I get too much further, which I'm not that far at all, spoilers for pretty much every console Assassin's Creed game and potentially any future DLC for Assassin's Creed Odyssey in case some of these ideas actually hit the mark. And on the note of Odyssey, this theory idea came to me shortly after I watched Ubisoft's video of the Legacy of the First Blade story arc coming as episodic content after launch. The part of the video that jumped out at me is a brief clip and follow-up image of Darius. For those finding this video that follow the Assassin's Creed lore but may be unfamiliar with the name Darius, beneath the auditory villa in Assassin's Creed 2 was the Sanctuary, a secret chamber containing seven different statues and prominent members of the Assassin Brotherhood. For a couple years after playing Assassin's Creed 2, I thought back to a few of the statues and the fact that some of them predated the events of the first Assassin's Creed game. Back then, I thought the Brotherhood always started around the era of the Crusades. By 2014, the statue that always struck me as having a particularly notable inscription was Darius. Detailed on Darius' statue was a message that he was the first recorded user of the iconic hidden blade the assassins are known to utilize to stealth kill their targets. Sometime before the story of Assassin's Creed Origins, Aya received Darius' hidden blade from Cleopatra and gifted the iconic weapon to Bayek of Siwa. Aya describes the Hidden Blade as a weapon of justice and demonstrates to Bayek how it functions. In our first look at Darius in Legacy of the First Blade, the Hidden Blade is on the outside of his forearm instead of on the underside. Jumping back a minute to the statue of Darius in the Sanctuary, we see here that not only is his overall look a tad bit different, but the Hidden Blade shown is on the underside of his right arm. Ubisoft not only knows exactly what Darius looked like, like we do, but they had a clear reference on showing how he held the blade. In an interview with the creative director for Origins, he said this when asked about the lore. Uh, for sure, on the lore side, we're sticking to the lore. There, that is, we hold sacred, you know, to, to the lore. Uh, it's, it's one thing that people ask us, if this is the, the birth of the Brotherhood, what about the assassins before this time, like Darius and Eltani, and we know they're there. This, uh, this holds <laughs> true to it. Uh, we actually even play with that a little bit. Um, uh, the, the, the story here is that it's the, the brotherhood that we know from AC1 in terms of their tenants, their symbology, their rituals, you know, the cut finger ritual, for example. What is the story behind that? Did they, one guy just decide to cut his finger off? <laughs> it's a little bit more involved than that. So we play with that for sure. So the lore we held sacred too. And there you have it. Now, on one hand, I personally don't think the writers have a clear idea on the overall direction of the story after Assassin's Creed 3 ended in 2012. But for the sake of the clip, Let's just say that they do. If the writers have as clear a picture as they claim, then the reasoning behind retconning ideas like Aya and Amunet from Origins is significant in some way. In the original E3 reveal and subsequent marketing for Assassin's Creed Origins, I was hooked on the idea of seeing how the Assassins got their start in ancient Egypt. By the end of Origins, players bore witness to the beginnings of the Brotherhood called the Hidden Ones but we're still hundreds of years before the era of the Levantine Assassins and later with Altair in the 11th century. As someone who still doesn't prefer Odyssey taking place before Origins, I wondered why go backward 400 years in the timeline instead of moving the story forward with regards to the Assassin vs Templar conflict. Well, therein lies my theory. What if Odyssey and its DLC is the game where players bear witness to the origin of free will versus control? I cherry-picked clips I'd like to play that should solidify where my point comes from and how I ended up where I did. A very intense moment from Assassin's Creed Brotherhood came near the end when Desmond Miles stabbed Lucy Stillman. The clip I want to play is actually from Assassin's Creed 3, where Desmond talks to his father William about what was happening in his mind and his body as he killed Lucy. Let's have a listen. I killed her, you know. I killed Lucy. It was the apple, son. It was Juno. I saw what she was. What would happen if I let her live? I could have stopped myself. I mean, there was a force there. But I didn't have to. I chose to. Desmond. Lucy was going to betray us and take the apple back to Abstergo. I saw the satellite launched. I saw them turn it on and then... It failed. So here we have a confession where Desmond vividly saw what would happen if Lucy obtained the apple. 
He visualized it so clearly that it convinced him to end the life of someone that only hours before he believed had his best interests at heart. Needless to say, the vision Desmond saw did not come to pass. And when speaking of visions that never came to pass, but are so vivid they could shake a person to their core, let us not forget how Commander George Washington felt after the creation of the United States when he, like Desmond, peered into a first civilization artifact. Connor! Thank God I found you. Commander Washington, I'm attacked by a new enemy. I fear I will succumb. What has come over you? God damn it, man, I need your help. Perhaps you should sit and tell me the problem. My God, I, I don't know what's happened. I've become... It's the dreams. They're driving me mad. I never thought you were a man that would be disturbed by dreams. You don't know. You can't understand. They beguile me with fantastical visions. In my dream, I met Mount Vernon during the war. In fact, in the dream, there is no war. I stay with Martha, tending to my fields, peaceful and content. It sounds like paradise. No, they don't stop there. The peace of the vision pushes me to... The dreams become unspeakable. You are in them, Connor. I believe the visions come from this. Where did you get it? It was taken from a captured officer at Yorktown. There was something compelling about it, so I kept it on my person. It's strange, for I cannot remember that officer's face. May I see it? You are not thinking clearly. You're right. It is the dreams. The dreams that come from this apple. In this next clip from Assassin's Creed 4 we're going to listen to, Desmond Miles details the reasons behind the first civilization choosing this specific version of him to save the world from the second solar flare. Not really sure how to explain. He saw glimpses of Adam and Eve and their escape from slavery. He saw the beginning and the end of the war between the first Civ and humans. He saw Minerva, Juno, and Tinia trying to work out their their calculations. At least that's what they called them. They, they had these tools, these powerful uh, machines that could predict possible futures. Not what was going to happen, but what, uh, what, what could happen. Probabilities. And, well, they spent a lot of energy trying to figure out what was the most likely scenario for the future. Theirs and ours. And in the end, I guess they figured I was their most likely candidate. Some guy named Desmond, living at the beginning of the 21st century of the Common Era. But which Desmond was the right one? Because, you see, probability is a weird thing. It can branch out in so many ways. Which version of me did they need? Was it the Desmond who got married early and had a son? One who stayed single in New York? Or, or was it the Desmond who moved to San Francisco to be a waiter? Maybe it was the Desmond who worked at an auto body shop in Chicago, or maybe it was the me who never ran away from his parents in the first place. First Civ had countless variations to choose from, but in the end, the uh, lucky one was me. I'm the Desmond their best calculations spit out. I'm the Desmond they left their messages for, and I guess I have to live with that honor. What an honor. Pretty tired. Uh, there'll be more later. Ciao. Between Connor, George Washington, Clay Kasmerick, and Desmond Miles, we have a number of examples where mankind has stumbled upon alternate realities, possible futures, as Desmond put it. In Assassin's Creed Revelations, after years of exile, Altair returns to Masyaf and confronts the current mentor of the Brotherhood, Abbas. Tell your men to stand down! No! I am defending Masyaf! Would you not do the same? You corrupted everything we stand for and lost everything we gained. 
All of it sacrificed on the altar of your own spite. And you! You have wasted your life staring into that apple, dreaming of your own glory. That is true, Abbas. I learned many things from the apple. Of life and death. Of the past and the future. Let me show you. In this scene, we learn that Altair peered into the first civilization artifact and looked forward in time. Using this knowledge, he was able to craft what may have been the inspiration to the gun, as well as modify a means so that the hidden blade did not require the ring finger to be removed for the weapon to function. Though on that one, as of Origins, we could debate that Altair could have also looked to the past. It's clear then that the Apple of Eden has the ability to project visions to whoever wields it but it doesn't appear to be a catch-all solution, nor do I believe it can show every potential split in reality. Or maybe it can, and the information retained or visualized is different from person to person. That is my theory. What I'm guessing here is that Alexios and Cassandra are two instrumental first civilization human hybrids that utilize this power at some point in Odyssey or throughout the DLC. I believe that separately they will come across an Apple of Eden and see into the future as others have done in previous games. Alexios will see a future of anarchy, a future where mankind runs rampant without a sound aspect of control to ensure that they do not destroy themselves. Cassandra on the other hand will see a future of slavery, a future where people are, as Edward Kenway so eloquently said, corralled into neatly furnished prisons, safe and sober yet dulled beyond all reason and sapped of all spirit. In my theory, I believe Cassandra will utilize the knowledge she gains from her piece of Eden to lay the groundwork for the inception of the assassins starting with the Hidden Ones, having already seen it in a possible future for humanity. Alexios, on the other hand, will utilize the knowledge he gains from the piece of Eden to lay the groundwork for the Templars, starting with either the Order of the Ancients or whatever group predates them between Odyssey and Origins. And that, ladies and gents, ushers in the war that will dominate centuries of conflict between two competing philosophies. And in case I didn't hammer home the point or just wasn't clear enough, Darius was actually the linchpin for this idea. The constant between him and every hidden one or assassin after him is the hidden blade. And yet everyone after him uses it differently. Was the original method on how he utilized the blade lost to time between Odyssey and Origins? Which, by the way, is the most likely answer. Or is the reason more closely tied to an Apple of Eden, the first civilization, and alternate realities? But that's actually where I'm going to end this idea for now. I'll be back in a part two after I know how the story of Odyssey plays out. Thanks so much for watching and listening. If you made it this far, subscribe to the channel. And if you enjoyed this kind of opinionated theory piece, give this video a thumbs up, share it with other Assassin's Creed lore enthusiasts, and uh, also let me know what ideas you feel are going to happen and play out in the story this time around. Again, my name is Justin, and I'll catch you in the next video. Take care.